modeling demo reel or showcase or something like that, you're going to find that um, but the majority of these to make use of these little turntables. Now, some of them see there's a turntable now that they're actually not parenting it to a actual cylindrical disc or something like that. But you can see the variety and their work. Right there, you see Now we can learn about working with lights, we can learn about animation, we can learn about rendering. We're not going to get it. We sit here, right? Go to new, call it a turntable project, make all those files. And I'm just going to go with start over with a new scene. Now, because we're dealing with time and time based content now, for the first time in Maya, some of you might have to finally deal with a timeline. And if you never noticed this, you see we've got this weird little timeline here that says 120 frames out of 200 frames. Well, we're not making a lengthy turn, right? We're just spinning once around. If we wanted to spin around twice, we can simply duplicate the clip inside of After Effects or Premiere and to get it to go twice. So what we don't want to do is spend all of our time rendering because that's where things get heavy and take a long time. So I believe last week I just said something like, all right, well, let's set our project now in mind to being our little running guy and making sure that we're working at a reasonable frame rate. Now, Maya by default loves 24 frames per second because it was built for film. Okay? Maya was the 3D software platform for doing all those special effects in movies and animations in movies and all that. Film is 24 frames per second. Digital video is typically 30 frames per second. So you can see where we can make adjustments to that. Now, for all reasonable purposes, we're not going to worry about the frame rate right now. I'm just going to leave it at 24. Just because again, it'll work just fine for a digital version for online content or something like that. I also want to make sure the playback speed is set to 24 frames per second X1, meaning real time, not play every frame. Because that will play it as fast as the computer can play it, but not at the 24 frames. So this is just our preferences for our time-based content here. I can hit save and it's good to go. Now I need to define my beginning, which will be frame one, and my end frame. Well, it says there that it's at 120 or 200 in the full length column. See, if I stretch it out, it's that's just the Maya default. If we're doing 24 frames per second, and we want it to last each turn around to last three seconds, that is what? 72. So we only need 72 frames here. Right? Three seconds at 24 frames per second is 72 frames. Pretty easy stuff there. But I'm going to enter that in both categories. See, because I have to say the length of what's viewable here, but also the end length. Now, how you make your turntable is completely up to you. Some people actually make little pedestals, 
Some people will make a platform that fits the content. Like if they make like a model of an ogre, the turntable itself will look like, you know, a little piece of earth with like a stump and a rock and give it a theme. Some people say, oh, I modeled a, an off-road vehicle. And so my turntable is like a gas can and some mud, and some tire treads, just to kind of fit the theme. In our case here, we're just going to keep it simple and stupid. And so all I'm going to do here is just drop on a cylinder. We haven't really discussed a whole lot about yet is size, scale, units, all of that. Some of the models we built, we used this grid, right, as kind of like the guide to go by. We know that the revolver we did is much larger than it because we had to increase our reference plane, which was originally a thousand by a thousand for like the chair and stuff like that. So even though this grid is essentially 20 centimeters by 20 centimeters, people often still model things based on the size of the grid. So we'll model a house the size of that grid. They'll model a human skull the size of the grid. They'll model a character the size of that grid without thinking in terms of, well, that's still only 20 centimeters by 20 centimeters, which is pretty small. So in our case, we're not gonna worry too much about units and size right now because we can always scale things down, right? As long as we delete history in our models when we import them in, we can scale it fit just as easily or scale it up to fit whatever it happens to be. So I'm just gonna make this roughly be about the size of my grid just because it's there, all right? And then if I want to, you know, I can have some fun with this little turntable here, this little thing, just by kind of maybe playing around with, you know, how many caps I want it to have. And I don't know why that does that now. It's like when you leave it as a primitive, like that, it has no problem adding its segmentation before you scale it and adapt it. But after, I don't know, it never used to do that, okay? So I just added a little more segmentation to this. And what that will allow me to do, of course, if I so want to, is I can double up in places, right? So I can give it a harder edge on the bottom. I can give it a harder edge up at the top, or I can even double click here and throw on a uh, bevel, you know, just to have some fun there. So that when I hit three on the keyboard, I have a nice, pretty, smooth cylinder, as opposed to the default cylinder, which we all know if we do that and hit three, it turns into almost like a weird little barrel looking thing. See that? So I just added a little bit more segmentation there to make it a little more smooth. Now I'm gonna go ahead and just freeze my transformations to zero all that out. I can come over here and delete my type history to get rid of all the history associated with this. I can come over here and call it turntable if I want to, right? Whatever it happens to be. The first things that I wanna do, okay? Because remember, I now have 72 frames of animation is I want to keyframe the animation of this rotate. Now, some people like counterclockwise, some people like clockwise. Um, I don't think it really matters all that much. Uh, so what we want to do, though, is make sure that we're keyframing the rotation. So I'll switch my rotate here. And you see the rotate I want to key is the green or the rotate Y. So at frame one, I'm going to highlight rotate Y right click and key select it. You notice how many heroes have a key framed in my other four? Not at all, right? So now you're gonna learn how to set keys, how to make stuff, how to make shit move, right? So all I did at frame one is I selected the rotate Y, I right clicked on it and I set key. You see it gives me a little red box there next to the rotate Y. And you see it gave me a red tick on the timeline right here at one saying, you've placed a key there. Now Maya by default does not activate auto key. 
It does exist, but it usually gets people in more trouble. That auto key is actually right to the left of the running man. But I want this to rotate one full rotation. So I'm going to come up to rotate Y here and just type in 360 degrees. Okay. And I'm now going to go to the end of time. Oops, type it again. The end of my timeline of frame 72, type in 360, right click and key selected. So that now you see it has given me a red slash here at frame one, a red slash here at frame 72. And if I hit play, I get rotation. However, what is the problem? What usually is great to have in Maya as the default actually hurts us here. And that is, you see, it is it starts slow, speeds up, and then comes to a slow stop. That is called a uh, ease in, ease out animation curve, which is usually what you don't get in other software and you want because it creates more natural movement, right? Light turns green, car takes off, reaches speed, sees a red light ahead, slowly comes to a stop. We throw a ball into the air, same process. But we don't want that ease in, ease out animation. We want it to be what's called consistent speed or linear animation. We do that by going window, animation editor, graph editor. Let me hit pause. Okay. So you see, this is the animation curve of movement. And you see how it is easing into that curve and easing out of that curve to come to a slow stop. We don't want that. We want what's called linear or flat or consistent speed. So I highlight it, right? I just highlight it around my curve here. Now, if I go directly to the top, you're going to see these curves First one is easy in, easy out, but the middle one here is a flat or linear tangent. So just by doing that, now when I hit play, you'll see it never slows down. It is a consistent loop, which means if I wanted this to spin around five times, it will never look different than spinning around once. So I'm getting that consistent loop, which is really, really highly, the highly desirable. See that? Consistent speed. All right, so we've got our movement done now. What else can we set up here, though, to guarantee that we're going to get, every time we throw a model on here, it's going to line up perfectly well? Well, let's set up our camera view. Now, I'm in perspective view here. So I still have perspective, top, front and side. But the problem is, if I go with perspective view and I bring in a model and I want to see does it fit on my turntable properly, I move my camera, I now can't line that camera up for all the other ones, right? So you want to lock that camera down. You want to make a custom camera that is locked down that will always be blasting in the same space, same location, same angle every time you go to render. And to do that, yeah, keep being so short. To do that, I'm going to go to create camera and just make a new camera. Now you see it dropped it right into the center there. See that? And this camera, I probably should do this just to be safe on the safe side. I'm going to come over and I'm going to call it turn table camera. Just so I know that is not the perspective camera. That isn't the front, the side, or anything. This is my turntable camera, which is what I want to render. But watch this cool technique. A lot of people in mind when I show them this, like, oh my gosh, that changes my whole way of working. Okay. Panels, perspective. You see, there's my perspective camera, but I'm going to choose turntable camera. Now, right now, it shows me I've got nothing because my camera is in the middle of my turntable. But if I just zoom out a little bit, ah, it's weird. I had that button activated by accident. Okay. All right. So basically, when I look through my turntable, I back up 
until I get a decent angle on my turn table. We might have objects that are tall, we might have objects that are long, we might have objects, right? So I want to get this camera set up in such a way so that no matter what I import in, scale and fit onto this turntable, I'm framing it really nicely. But there's a few really cool things to do before that. I don't know if you've noticed, but what you see here in this view is not what renders. It's not what comes out. And that's because we need to go to the view, see this? And then there are things here like camera settings. Show me my film gate. Ooh, see how it just masked that off? That actually is what the camera captures. It doesn't capture any of this over there. This could also have to change and alter itself depending upon what kind of camera we're going to render. 1920 by 1080, 720, 480, super widescreen, uh, 640, 640. That will change that viewport. By just coming over in this view, though, and activating film gate, I could also go safe action, safe title, right? And change what is actually going to render. Because a lot of people do this. They'll set up an animated scene and they'll start rendering, and they're like, wait a minute, when I was in Maya, this was visible. Oh, you forgot to take into account the film game, just like looking through a normal video camera. Not everything you see shows up when you put it out in the aspect ratio or whatever you're working at. So now that I've got this here and I can see what I'm looking at, now I'm just going to frame it up. Now, we have giant TV screens. We have giant computer monitors, right? So the days of you know, coming over here and just doing something like that, stop it, okay? Give yourself ample room to kind of see your objects. Something like that is perfectly fine. Now, now that I got my camera angle looking well, I said earlier, the last thing I want to do in turntable camera here is move this camera. Because I want all my shots, I want that turntable shot by shot by shot, model after model after model. I want that turntable to never move. So as it's spinning, the models change out, but the turntable isn't moving up, down, sideways, scaling in, out, or any of that. So what I'm going to do with that camera here, view, select camera, view, watch this, lock that camera. So I've locked the turntable camera so it will not, see, it won't move anymore. It won't tumble. And now that I've got that done, I can just go back here to my perspective camera, see, and move around and do what I need to here in my perspective camera because there's my turntable camera, but it's locked. So a lot of people, what they'll do is they'll set their perspective camera up and everything, and they'll get the perfect shot, and then they'll start rendering, and they'll be like, oh, wait, no, I've got to do something. So they'll go back, and they'll accidentally nudge their perspective camera and go back to rendering, and so they end up with a bunch of frames properly rendered, and then all of a sudden, the camera shifts and moves because, oh, man, I moved my camera. So that's where you use your own custom camera there and lock it down, okay? And we're going to tell it to render that camera only. So we've got a turntable. We've got our camera ready to set up, okay? Even in my perspective here, if I want to, see, I can still go to camera settings and turn on the film gate to see, in a way, what's included or not, even though this is not the camera I'll be rendering. But now we need to think about the basic light setup, okay? Now, we've all had observational drawing or some class like that, right, where they basically talk about three-point lighting. It's the best ultimate way to show off the three-dimensionality of an object. A key light, a fill light, and maybe a backlight or something like that. So when something is rotating around, you're seeing that light move across the surface, which gives us the best three-dimensional, uh, which is what we're showing off here, right? So to make the lights, I'm going to come here, light. I'm going to do a spotlight okay now watch how cool this is let me activate that light so but 
This is the coolest. Watch this. Panels. Look through selected. And then scroll out. I am literally looking through like a camera right now. So I can aim that light exactly where I want it to go without having to move handles and move it and, you know, using the, the, the gizmo or something like that. Now, I'm not going into Arnold lights. I'm not showing you fancy lights like that because right now we're not showing that. We're showing the model. Okay, but if I hit the attribute editor, control A for my light, I typically like to keep my spotlight, you know, a little more intensity than base, a little bit more of a cone angle. I don't mess around with penumbra or drop off right now because I'm not trying to recreate reality. I'm just trying to light this stage or this turntable. I do like to use, to get the best three dimensionality, a combination of a warm light, okay, so I'll just make a slightly warmer light than normal. I like to go into my shadow, and this is again, what creates reality, what gives the illusion of three dimensionality, multiple lights and multiple shadows. So what I want is I want a, if I make a warm light, I'm gonna wanna have a cool, shadow okay so yellowish warm orange lights make warm make cool blue purple shadows um i don't know if it'll actually work here yeah kind of you can kind of see my shadow here i don't know if you can tell right there but we have yellow lights and what are they giving off purple shadows next time you're by a, a red light or a green light in traffic stop find something that's white put your hand against it and if it's a green light it gives off a dark red shadow if it's a red light it gives off a dark green shadow it's more based in reality. So I just made a warm light. I'm aiming it there at mine at about 1.5. Again, I don't want to overlight this. I can always make corrections to it. And I'm aiming there at my pedestal. Okay. Light number one, I'm going to go back to create light, another spotlight, another panel, look through selected. Back it up, change the angle, and I'm going to do the opposite angle. So there's my other light there. So I'm coming at it at opposite angles here. I'm going to leave it one intensity. I'll make it a cool light. And the shadow color, because it's cool, will be a warm or a dark warm shadow. Just a great way to understand how this works. And by the way, guys, you could also come over here. Oh, you'll see these are actually already activated for ray trace. Ray trace gives you reflections. Okay. But it doesn't matter if you don't activate them. And it doesn't matter if you don't use a Lambert or a Fong or, you know, Lamberts don't have reflections. Okay. So I'm just going to boost that cool light. And then finally, I'm going to create a backlight by just using a point. This one doesn't really matter much in terms of color, but I am going to put it back behind or opposite. So remember, we could always go to a top down and look at all this. Okay, so here is my light one. Here is my light two. And here will be my spotlight opposite those. And there again, you can use color. Doesn't really matter, but what really is important here is I do not want my backlight to cast shadow. Or else my model will be lost in shadow. So I'm going to turn off the shadows, maybe turn down the intensity of this point light, just so it's there, but it's not obnoxiously there. Let's go back now to our turntable camera to see what that looks like. Activate light, texture. Okay, I can even put my uh, ambient occlusion in there just to see what that's now starting to look like. So I've got a tan table. I have it spinning, rotating properly at a consistent speed. I've got a brand new camera set up here to actually do all my rendering. That actually centered. Yeah, I've got to unlock my 
camera just to get it nudged there. It's a little better. Okay, and I've got three point lighting. Now that I've got that set up, let me just go ahead here. Now that I've got it set up this far, the last thing I want to set up for this file, the C file, is the rendering attributes so that when I render it, meaning bring the model in and then do that real pretty kind of rendering of it using the shadows, using the lights. But I need to set up the render settings. And to set that up, I'm going to go up here to the little movie clacker with the little gear on it that basically is render settings. Most of you, any of you probably have never done this before. So now you're seeing, now I'm doing the base old school way of rendering as well. Now to set up this rendering, you see when I launch the render settings, by default, it isn't correct. But once I save it, it will save those settings. Now you see, first off, it's rendering the master layer. Well, I haven't made any layers to, to, to do that, so that's fine. The second it says is render using Arnold Renderer. Boo, I like the more Arnold Renderer. Render Arnold is too, it's way too complex for what my, my needs are right now. So I'm gonna switch that down to software render. By the time we do the wireframe, we'll be doing hardware render. Here in the Maya software, I've got some attributes to adjust. Common, number one, file name. Well, I don't have the file in here yet, but it would be something like uh, revolver unshaded, revolver shaded, revolver wireframe when it comes time to render those settings, render those names. You also see we've got some settings for image formats. Now I teach class, exploration media tools and survey media and all that stuff, and we lecture on file types. I don't know why PNG is the default. PNG is nice. It's like the new, it's the modern JPEG. PNG will hold an alpha channel, but PNG is limited colors. It's not good for smooth gradations of pixels. It's very good for solid flat values. So PNG, although it's the default, don't do it. But you can see here, we could do it as a PSD. You can do it as a JPEG, an EPS, an ADI, so you can do video, but don't do video. Okay, you've got QuickTime here. My favorite. Now, again, you may have other teachers that don't suggest this, but my favorite file type to do is called a Targa. Some of you have probably never, ever used a Targa file before. But a Targa is a lossless file type, meaning it will not compress and lose quality. It has an alpha channel associates it, which means everything that is not rendered, like all this empty space, is transparent. And the best thing about doing Targa sequences of all is a sequence. So I can render the highest possible quality. If you render as a JPEG, it's gonna compress it. You're gonna lose quality immediately. That's the problem with JPEGs. But Targos don't do that. They're a lossless format, not a lossy format. But the Targos means when I render my 72 frames, if I wanna put that away somewhere, I can zip that folder at a much smaller size than if I tried to put out an actual video. Plus, if I'm talking separate machines here, I can do one through 72 on this machine, one through 72 of the other version. I get every computer here rendering the 72 frames as targets, grab those folders and files, put them all together, zip it, and it's the highest possible quality as opposed to a QuickTime or a JPEG or an ADI, which automatically compresses it and has to hold all these files until the very last frame is done to convert it to a video now. Moving down here, frame animation extension. By default, it's single frame. A lot of when students are like, I'm trying to render this Mr. Liebman, but it only does one frame. I'm like, did you go into the settings and change? Huh? You know, change where it says single frame. All these file types are available. The best one that uh, uh, Adobe prefers is name underscore number extension. So if I were to call this chair untextured, it would be chair untextured underscore OO, see I got frame padding of four, chair underscore OO01 dot target. 
share untextured underscore o o o two dot target. That is the sequence that we're trying to create. Keep going down in my options here. You see next one here, it says, what is the start frame? Well, yes, that is one. What is the end frame? So oh, that to be 72. Okay, so we're only doing 72 frames. Very important here, renderable cameras. You can create a scene file and put five or six cameras in there and they will all render at the same time. So I could literally make like a 3D scene with some animated characters or something like that. I have a camera over there, a camera over there, a camera on my face, okay? Camera further away getting a medium shot of me, an over the shoulder camera that follows me everywhere I go. And when I hit render, as long as those cameras have all been designated as renderable, it'll render them all at the same time. So it render, you know, over the shoulder camera, frame one, face camera, oh, one, far camera, oh, one, you know, wide camera, oh, one, render each first frame and then go and do frame two for all those cameras. So that's pretty cool that you can render them all at the same time. But we have to make sure that we're rendering the proper camera. We don't want to render perspective. We want to render the turntable camera. And you can see include the alpha channel. Image size, again, HD 540. Who's ever used that? I don't know why that's the default, but that is the default, okay? What we want is a 1080 HD, 1920-1080. By the way, if you ever wanna make a good high quality rendering, that's camera ready, you can actually change the resolution, but don't do that for, for a sequence. Because video animation, we're not making 4K, okay? Not making 8K. But if you want, you can always go camera ready for a single still if you want to. All right. That is all we need to do here in these options for the render common section. But I'm still not done because, Mr. Lehman, how come when I rendered it, it looks like crap? Well, did you go to the options here and change it from low quality to a higher quality? Huh? It's low quality by default because it's trying to say, don't render a final version of anything until you render a low quality version of everything. Okay. Now, the best way to understand what this basically means is low quality. You can see here things like ray tracing are off by default. The ray tracings are reflections, refractions really good lighting, really good textures, okay? If you jump up to like a high quality, you notice everything's still off. If I go into highest quality, everything's still off. So just because you change this doesn't mean it works. So I'm gonna go to high quality here. Number of samples of shading, one, two, that just means how many passes is it gonna take before you get the final result. I've known people that have boosted it every single thing here and then they complain how come it's taking 58 hours to render one frame so don't boost anything you don't know about we're not doing particles okay i could turn on multi-pixel filter but again what's it do if you don't know leave it off okay the only thing you might want to turn on and activate here if you want to is the ray tracing and that is the, and there's even motion blur. Now we're not really doing motion blur. We don't want motion blur, but if you had an animated character that's jumping around, motion blur is kind of nice. It does triple the render time because your render, your each, each frame has to basically count for three frames back and one frame forward. That's what motion blur is. Is it's basically saying, take this frame. And when I move to the next frame, include that previous frame as a blurred out shutter speed kind of blur. So we don't need that because we're not doing motion like animation, we're just spinning. So ray tracing is about the only thing you really need to add here in these render. And there's even more render options, post-processing, you see apply fog. You can get this set up so we can send it to other compositing softwares. You can render by layers. So think about if you make a scene that's got a foreground, a middle ground and a background. You can actually render the foreground, the middle ground, and the background as separate layers 
and then re-put it together in After Effects or some other compositing package, which makes it faster to render than if you render it all in one, what's called Beauty Pass, where it has to render things far, things middle, and things near, and, and literally put it all together. So lots of other options we can do here. Pretty much all I need to do, or I like to do, is activate the ray tracing, maybe even add a reflection channel, just to double up on my reflection quality, which only matters if I'm using shaders that are reflective, I'll work on the clay, or work on the, you know, the, the wireframe. That's all we got to do. That's it. It close. Okay. Now I have everything set up now to start to. Let me just save it. And now it's time to start to think about bringing in geometry here. Well, that could be something as simple as, let's see, what am I going to import here? Right, so you have all your Maya binaries, you have all your FBXs, comfy couch, headphones, let's go with headphones. And I think I've got students' headphones here. Let's see, where's a good one? Now that's just an FBX. Now remember, I have locked this camera, so I might want to jump over to my perspective. Grab it right here. Evolved, bevel, bevel. <clears throat> this was never grouped properly, so I'm just going to. There. So all I've done is just highlighted and shift and control selected everything of this headphone. Before I go crazy with it, now that I have it all selected, I'm going to hit it and group it, just so I have one master node. I can scale this up. It looks because I did it or they did it, it is perfectly centered onto my headphones here or onto the uh, axes at zero, zero, right? It is slightly off my turntable. Let's double check in a top down. Oh, that looks centered. That looks centered. Okay. I can even do it like this where I can say, hey, yeah, that's my turntable camera. And now you can even see on the turntable camera, is it going to fit well? Maybe I'll give myself a little more headroom. Like that. Now, these headphones are not textured, right? Maybe they are, maybe they are, let's see. No, they're not textured. Okay, so this is the unshaded headphone right now. Now be aware of this too. Remember, I've always talked about this, that if I group something like this and I've scaled it and I've moved it into place, it's nice to freeze the transformations to zero it out so in case this gets moved or rotated by accident or scaled by accident, I can simply come here and say zero and one to get it where I need it to be. All right, so I now have this first part, these headphones, they're there, they're on my turntable. All I need to do is shift turntable and hit P or what's called edit parent. So that now my headphones are going to follow the turntable. Now you also notice when I merged it in there that it actually expanded my timeline as well back up to 120 or 200. It's going to happen. Nothing really about it because it doesn't really matter because we're only rendering 72 frames. So I have my unshaded headphones ready to go. They're on my tripod, on my turntable here. The last thing I want to do now is go back to the word common here and give this a file name, which would be headphones 
complicated, or you can call it what's called the clay, right? Clay view here. And I also, oh, I did that too soon. Well, also thought about here, watch this. Let me just do uh, unparent a second. I could very well have come here. I didn't think about it and just tossing on something like a fong or a bling, blin, or something like that. I didn't give my tribe, my, my turntable here, a shader of any type. Now, remember, it's kind of nice to do that just because, especially if I were to come in and give it a separate color. So it's there, but it's not overwhelmingly there, right? So now let's go back, shift, parent P, double check my output. So it's headphones clay, close. All I need to do now is go to my rendering menu set. We haven't been here really yet. Render, batch render. Now, if I save this, I can copy, put that on this desktop and batch render on this machine. Set up the next one to maybe render or put all three of them, put three of them on here. This would be untextured, this would be textured, that could be wireframe. And that way, all these are working while I'm just sitting here waiting for them to be finished. Because you see, I hit rendering and it's saying result rendering with Maya software. There it goes, see? And that's pretty darn quick. See, frame four, frame five, frame six, frame seven. It's going fairly fast there. And it's rendering outside of Maya. So I can keep working here while that's rendering. I can even shut down Maya and it will see, still keep rendering. If you ever need to cancel the render, you would have to go to render, cancel batch render, to cancel it, or close down the Maya batch render, which is what control off the leads and go fire. I can temporarily view what's rendering here in my view segments. That's the chair. Here's headphones here, headphones clay, it open. This launches what's called F check. And you can see the, so you can see why I did that fong as black with ray trace. It's kind of hard to see, but you can actually see the reflection in the turntable there. It's kind of a nice little rendered view of it. So where are you at? Frame 34, 35, 36. It's going pretty quick here. See, and then it'll play it real time. See, it now says rendering completed. So just that quickly. Don't get used to that. That was very quick that it rendered. It usually doesn't render that quickly there. And remember, it also comes with an alpha channel, see, which means everything that is black is see through. So I can put it on any color background. I could put it over top of reference images or concept art. If I've modeled something over concept art, I could put this over an environment, you know, like if I'm modeling this, you may have seen this actually in the breakdowns or the making of like Aquaman, where they'll actually take like his spear or something and they'll show it spinning around, but it's spinning around in the environment, the CG environment of Aquaman to see how it would look in those lighting in those reflections and that's in that environment where they'll put the hawk and the hawk will be standing there doing a 360 and they're just testing out the lighting they're testing out his textures to see does it pick up the lighting inside the cg or the live action plate so watch your making of films all right so i've got my unshaded version right now i know i don't this this does not have textures associated with it All right, it didn't come with fancy textures here, so I'm just going to come here, make a few little blends that I can quickly toss on. Have some texturings, turn that on. So I've got a red rubber plastic. Let's go with a, I don't know, a light blue with, I don't know, let's just put a small little bump map on it. Where's my 
fractal. I'm just making up some texture here. have a little bit of texture to it all. It looks like these. Bigger detail, there we go. And this, I don't know, I'll put a bump map on it that looks a little different. There's one here called leather. Oh, it is leather. Really didn't go over a whole lot on how to do textures, but I'm just making basic shaders. Let's just go with a shiny white. Okay, so I've got this here. Let's make the headphone parts be red. And I'll make this white, this white. Just trying to make a variety here. I'd like to make the padding here even right white, but that would require me selecting by face. Let's go with that. Oh, and if you don't know, in the modeling, because these never got modeled properly or textured properly, I'll just do an automatic model no, uh, texture map. There we go. Happy, whatever. Okay, so let's say that this is my textured version. Right? So one of my options here, headphones, I could call it textured, shaded, right? These, you know, shaded is the proper term to use here. Close. Rendering, render, batch render. And now I'm going to do the shaded version of this. Now I know here in my images, this is where it's put all of our renders, but I want to get rid of the chairs from last week a second. So it's just the headphones. In fact, I could even come make a folder here and start dropping in the shaded, the unshaded uh, for the headphones in the image search. So let's look at C, look at the sequence for here. Okay, there's my clays. Where's my shaded? Here they come now. And now you can see what that texture will look like on those headphones. For some reason, the blue looks better than the red. But... Okay. You see, it's also going a little bit slower than it did with the unshaded. Last thing I'm going to do here is a wireframe. Now, to do this best, I'm going to go ahead and reapply that Lambert. That plain, basic, unshaded Lambert. Go to my options now because the wireframe version doesn't exist here in the options for Maya software. It only exists here in the hardware. Let's cross your fingers because this is where it crapped out on me last week. Okay. Everything else can stay the same, except maybe telling this to be the wireframe. By a hardware 2.0. Okay, now you see here there are some settings here, like uh, render options, lighting mode using all, render mode shaded and textured, no, wire on shaded, wire. See that wire on shaded and textured. So I, if I do wire, it's going to be a transparent wireframe version, which can be kind of ugly. So I'm going to say wire on shade. 
and let's see here, today's screen. If need be, we can temporarily just hit this render option and it'll show me what wireframe unshaded looks like. And that's pretty cool looking, see that? So that's literally rendering the high quality render, but it's showing me the wireframe on that version. That's pretty cool. As opposed to, like I said, if I were to, And why do we show wireframe? Because it shows off the topology. Okay, so what if I came down here, wire and shade, and just said wire and do a temporary render? Where'd it go? Well, doesn't show up. Okay, what about wire unshaded and textured? Now, one of the reasons why that's not really working there, I'm gonna go back to wire unshaded, is because there's my progress in the background here. Did it already finish? Oh. Headphones clay. It's from 71. Oh, it already finished. Okay. So let's just do this wire unshaded, close, render, batch render. So this gives me my third pass, as it's called. I've got my clay version or unshaded. I've got my shaded or simple textured version. And I have my wireframe render using hardware. Now, what the heck do we do with all that stuff? Well, we're going to load it into After Effects. as a composition where I can, that one version I said had that little thing that went across and revealed the wireframe, right? We can do just a opacity shift for each of these. See, and that wireframe is already done. That's pretty crazy to see how, uh, how it turned out. View sequence. And there it goes right there. Now, again, it might look extra dark to you, but that's because it's on that black background. Once I bring that into After Effects, it won't have that issue. Right? It's got an alpha. Okay. So here in After Effects, I'll just go New Project. <laughs> there we go. Now, whether if you everyone here's used After Effects in some way, shape, or form, again, it's recording this so you can get to see it. So again, I can right-click import, I can file import, I can drag in there. I'm just going to import file. Okay, so here it knew already to go to the right folder. I'm going to choose target sequence 001 for the clay, and make sure the sequence button is activated. It okay because it's got an alpha, and if I drag that down, you see that's what it looks like. Right? Let's import file. The shaded right there. Sequence import. Okay with alpha. Import file. Wireframe. Oh oh one. Sequence activated, import, OK. So I've got three versions or three passes of the same geometry. This is also what's kind of cool here because immediately I can say, yeah, you know what? Layer, new, solid. Give me a decent gray background that is not as obnoxious as the black. And you see suddenly it does show up better. But when I brought and imported this in, this first one, and dragged it in the composition, it only made it for the 72 frames and it doesn't know what frame rate to do this at it's going by the default after effects setting so composition settings see it's at 30. well i did this at 24 and it said okay well that's 212 well three six nine twelve seconds should be the length here do 12 because I want it 
each of these to have its own rotation. And then I'm going to have one in the beginning. So let's say I'm going to go with the unshaded version, duplicate. And duplicate for the end. So it starts and ends at the same spot. Now let's go with the shaded version. Duplicate that. Double it up. Okay. The wireframe. Actually, I guess they could have gone away with nine instead of 12. All right, so I'll just lock that down. Two being. Nine. I don't know why it says 13. Weird. Wow. Okay, so you see what I'm doing here is I'm just doubling up. So the first thing we're going to see is our unshaded version. As that unshaded version goes by, this guy, the shaded version, is going to opacity shift off to on. So it's, or we could do a transition that goes across like that way. It doesn't really matter. Now we go here, and same with this one, it's going to be off, key, on, see, so it's going to give me a fade to the wireframe. Then finally here, I'm just going to key this opacity off. Now, that doesn't mean I can't come in here to these. Like, and I could say, yeah, you know what? I wish that was brighter. I've got the ability of coming over to like doing simple color corrections, like doing levels or something like that. Just saying, yeah, that's a little too dark. Maybe I want to brighten it up a little bit there. And what's cool is I can take that level, copy it right here. Oh, this one? Yeah. There. So I just increase the brightness on those by copying and pasting the levels before it goes back to the loop. So I have made a simple loop of the three passes, right? And you see that smooth transition to fade away to reveal, so you can see the topology, you can see that structure. Um, I don't know how smooth level, I could have done a low poly version and then a high poly version, version with the smooth, a version without the smooth. I didn't double check that before I rendered. I think this, that does well, that does look smooth. Okay, so maybe it's got a smoother apply. But you see, it's a nice, clean transition between the different passes. I could even, if I went to here, watch how cool this is. File, save as, 3D modeling, turntable project. I'll put it in the movie section here, and I'm going to name this uh, three pass composition. Um, so. As an After Effects file, 
Now I can come in, put in my action title safe. That gives me a grid that lets me know where my text can or can't go. Right? A. Well, correctly. What is it? Maybe modeling. Paragraph justification. Put that inside my action title safe, make sure that goes up where it needs to be. I can even come in here, key opacity, and have even that fade up and down. I'm just copying my keys here. That now fades out. I can duplicate that whole layer there. Text. And come over here and say, okay, and what the hell is this, right? Uh, uh, multi spline. What the hell do we call this? The, always a chance to say this. Uh, spline curve NURBS headphones. We'll just call it spline and curve modeling headphones. Right. Whatever information is important to say what this is. Even jump over here really quickly. Select my headphones. Go to display, heads up display, poly count. And it says here that it is 82864 faces. 82864 faces. 2864, we'll just say. All the important information right there as an After Effects file. Now I could put the reference image in the back. I could play around with even, like I say, maybe if I want to brighten all this up, just like I showed you before. So I could literally throw on a adjustment layer right there that could easily be a color correction, brightness, contrast, colorize, exposure, anything here. Okay? And that will update and expose everything underneath of it to make it a little bit nicer. Whatever it happens to be. Now all I got to do is add to media encoder Q. Or, and that will let me render this out, or I could just leave this as is and do another composition of the same process. But I'm going to do this because, again, I can use editing tools to kind of do the next, the next, the next. Because I like this the way the setup is. And yes, After Effects is not an editing software. It's a compositing software. So here, all I need to do in my media encoder is just set it up to be Put it to my movie folder as an H.264. Let it pull up here. Come on. There it is. Get off animated GIF. This could just be an, an H.264. Match the source, or if you want to do it in a, I don't care here, you could do it as a YouTube or a Facebook 1080. Doesn't really matter. I'll just say match the source. Give it a name and an output. Again, I'm putting this in the movies. I'll just call it headphones. Hit OK. Hit the render button and encode that entire clip. I take no time at all. See, it's going really quick because it's short. Okay, so I'm done. Now I can go back to Maya here. 
Okay. Delete the head code. Come back into my file. Come back to import. Find a uh, comfy couch. Okay. Import the comfy couch. Switch on over here to my perspective window where I can get this loaded up on my turntable. I've got my turntable here. This is the untextured. Parent it. Now I could hit a one here. Is it one or three? Doesn't really matter. Okay. Got my, couch. got my couch. This couch is what? This is the untextured couch. So I can come back now to my software section here. Unshaded software, everything is still set up correctly. Yep, everything's still set up here. Render, batch render. Just going to toss on a quick little shader here. Whatever. Perfect world, you would be doing some texture here. <coughs> There's my ear. Um, ah, see, that's what I need. That's my place 3D texture. Okay, let's go ahead up to my options here since that's rendering right now. This one will be my textured or shaded. Already ready to go, right? Yep, it's all ready to go. All I gotta do is wait for that to stop rendering there. By the way, as quick as, quick as it's going, yes, I have had 48 hour. I started rendering an image on a Friday and Monday, it's still going because I'm looking for super reflective ray tracing, all that. See, done. That means I can jump really quickly to my rendering menu and batch render this one. Let's go back to the regular Lambert. Go back to my render options, switch to hardware, and everything here should be ready to go. Wire unshaded, all I gotta do is change my name to being wireframe. Here again, this even says that this is 3000, sorry, 32112. 32, what was that going to do? Well, here. Thirty-two. Okay. This is the the uh, comfy couch. Dude, modeling. Yes, we call it something like that. That's all ready to go right there. And finish rendering. Forty-nine fifty. 
So it's still rendering the couch to be textured, shaded. But this is why it's nice to split your projects up over multiple computers because you can literally have all of them fired up, ready to go, and just go bink and be done. Four, 66, 67, 68, 69. All right, almost done. Rendering post processing and completed. Finally, I'll render the wireframe. Now, watch how cool this is. This is why I'm showing you this process of working here, right? Because I already had this one done, that's why I rendered it off. Watch how cool this is. All right, which one is this guy? This is the headphone clay or unshaded, right? Right click, replace file. Couch unshaded or clay, right there. Import, okay? This guy, this is the shaded headphones. Right click, replace file. Look for couch shaded, import. Headphones wireframe. Now let's make sure it's finished before I do this. Yep, it's done. Right? Headphones wireframe, replace file couch wire. Right there. So now, so far, I have my After Effects all ready to go to actually now render out my couch. And all I had to do was do it once. All I had to do was make my turntable once. All I had to do was make my After Effects composition once, and it's ready to go, see? So I got my couch now. And now let's go ahead and send this off to the media encoder. Add the media encoder queue. Here it is here. H264, match source, just make sure you got the name, which would be couch, right? Save, okay, and code. So once you get the system down here, right? I'm done with the couch, get rid of the couch. Let's import the next one. Uh, Let's do the poly chair. Okay, uh, perspective. Take these guys and group them. Hey, got to be careful here. They're not exactly centered. There we go. So I've got my chairs here now as a group. Put them to my tripod or to my turntable here. Right. Go to my option settings. Back to software. Everything should be set up. All I got to do is change the name. Chairs. Uh, clay. Close, render, batch render. This says that it's 1,678 polys. This is the extruded chair modeling everything ready to go there bias rendering the unshaded one again i come up now that the unshaded is there let's go ahead and toss on a texture now i don't have a texture per se that looks like wood. So I'm gonna to just toss one into the, one of these blends.
In there, go. Be about it. Think. Come back and set my settings. So that was the clay model. This is now going to be the shaded or textured model. Still rendering in the background here. Now, for some reason, this has got three chairs. I'm going to get rid of the three. Just because I can. Just put one in there. It's less confusing. There we go. I'll finish rendering. Let's go ahead and render the shaded one now. There's our shaded version. Back to our clay. Which means now we can swap to wireframe. So you see, it's a very simple process. Once you get down these basic settings of, okay, well, I've got this going, I've got that going right now. I can come here and say, okay, hey, chair. So this is uh, couch unshaded. Let's replace that with the chair unshaded. Chair's clay. Now, when I did that, there's a weird, bizarre thing going on here. What is that? Is it a reference image that showed up? Let's see. Chair shaded. Chair clay. Yeah, there's a stone floor that was left in here from a fire. Oops. All right. So I got to re-render that. And there it is, under the So I got to redo the texture and everything because there was a stone floor twisted. Here. So let's go back to where? Share. Shares, shares, 